Well, good, good morning and happy Easter. Happy Easter, and uh, welcome to our celebration of the resurrection. We're very excited. Four weeks ago, we, uh, we kicked off a three Sunday morning service experiment with a series that we're calling Surprise, the Miracles uh, of, of Jesus. And this morning, we've come to what? The greatest miracle, the greatest surprise in all of human history, and that is the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Now, before we open our Bibles to the scripture that deals with what we're going to be talking about this morning, where Jesus rose again on Sunday morning, I want to sort of set up the context for the story we're going to be looking at. So let me take you back a couple of nights to the Thursday night, all right, where uh, Jesus eats a special meal with his disciples. And something for you to understand is that Jesus' death took place during the Jewish feast of the Passover. And it's extremely important for us to understand that because something that we've been saying in this series is that there's a massive difference between Eastern thinkers and Western thinkers. So as Western thinkers here in Canada, we're used to just people telling us the truth. We're very abstract and people will describe things to us and tell us things. But as an Eastern thinker, Jesus and the people that he was communicating with, they would have been more used to not just being told the truth, but being shown the truth with dramatic action. Okay, and because Jesus wanted to show his disciples, not just tell them, to show them the meaning of his death on the cross the next day, he met with his disciples in an upper room. And they got together in this house and celebrated the Passover meal like a family. Some people call this the Last Supper. The Bible says, when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And so Jesus is saying that somehow this Passover meal that they're about to eat together is something that he is going to fulfill in the next few days. What does that mean? Well, I suggest to you it means that in the Passover meal, Jesus is showing his disciples Showing us, not just telling us, the truth about who he is and his mission of hope and grace. You see, the Passover is a meal that Jewish families have been celebrating for thousands and thousands of years. It goes all the way back to the days of Moses. It is highly symbolic. Every aspect of the Passover meal means something, reminds a Jewish family about what God did when he rescued the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt about 1,500 years before Jesus lived. Uh, how many of you have watched that epic movie, The Ten Commandments, okay, with Charlton Heston and uh, Moses, all right? So that's telling the story of the Passover. More recently, how many of you have watched um, The Prince of Egypt, I think it's called, is that, is that it? Yeah, okay. Um, so again, that sort of describes the story of Exodus that we find in the Old Testament. So every part of this Passover meal that Jesus had with his disciples on that Thursday night is done in such a way that demonstrates that Jesus is going to fulfill their hope for a new Moses, a new deliverer, a new Messiah. And let me give you one example of how Jesus did this. He did this in many ways. He did it with the cup. He did this with the lamb, which by the way, there was no lamb on the menu because Jesus was going to be the lamb of God. But that evening, before the Passover meal began, it was tradition that the father of the family would pull out a single piece of matzah, which is unleavened bread, and it looks like this, okay? And I have a piece here, you can see what it looks like up on the screen. The father will give thanks to God in the meal, and at a very certain point, they will, he will break off a piece of the matzah bread like this. And they call that piece the afikoman. Can you all say that with me? Afikoman. Let's try one more time. Afikoman. There you go. So what happens is the father will wrap that in a very special cloth, okay? Fold it neatly and wrap it. And he will hide it somewhere in the house, okay? And then later that night, after the meal is done and after the sun goes down, the children will be set out to find that piece of bread. And the one who finds it and brings it back to the father will receive a reward. Now, let me tell you what the afikoman symbolized. Back in Jesus' day, this piece of bread that was broken off represented the Messiah, and they believed that the Messiah was sort of hidden away for a season, had been broken off and was hidden from the people, but that one day he would return and he would come and he would save them. 
And so the appearance of the afikoman at the end of the meal just reminded them that one day our Messiah, our Deliverer, will come for us. So now we can understand a little better what Jesus did in the Passover meal in the upper room. It says that he took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. What is Jesus saying? Check this out. Jesus broke off this that represented their deliverer, their Messiah. The one that they believed was still separated from God's people. Held it up in plain view and said, this is me. Now, if Jesus was a Western person, he would have just said, hey guys, I'm the Messiah. I'm the long-awaited Moses-like deliverer that you've been hoping for. But that wouldn't be any fun. As an Eastern thinker, Jesus doesn't want to just say it. He wants to show it in the most exciting way. But you have to understand his context. Now, the next day, on the Friday morning, Jesus was crucified on a cross. And like he predicted the night before, okay, when he held up that broken piece of matzah, Jesus' body was broken. Like he demonstrated the night before with the afikoman, Jesus' body was placed in a burial cloth, wrapped in a cloth, very carefully folded. And just like the afikoman, Jesus' body was hidden away from sight when they laid him in a tomb and rolled a heavy stone across the entrance. Hopefully, friends, this is beginning to give you an idea of just what Jesus meant when he said that I am going to fulfill the Passover in the days to come. Now, that's what happened on Thursday night. Jesus celebrated the Passover. And that's what happened on Friday. He fulfilled the Passover by dying on the cross and being buried away in a grave. Now let me tell you what happened on the Sunday after Passover. So we're going to skip Saturday for a second and talk about Sunday. On the year that Jesus died, the Sunday after Passover was another Jewish holiday, a minor holiday called First Fruits. And the Feast of First Fruits, it wasn't required that you had to come to Jerusalem for it, like with the Feast of Passover, but it was a celebration of the first harvest, and that is the barley harvest. People would pick a ripe sheaf of barley and bring it into Jerusalem as their symbolic first fruit offering, and in the hopes that a greater harvest would come later. That year when Jesus was killed on Passover Friday, the Feast of First Fruits just happened to be three days later, the following Sunday. Now, here's something maybe you didn't know. On the Sabbath, that is the Saturday before First Fruits, to get ready for First Fruits, there was a tradition for Jewish people who lived in Jerusalem to come to the temple that day and to pray for life to come to the ground, out of the ground. As a way of preparing for the festival of first fruits, on that Saturday, it would be tradition in Jesus' time that they would read Ezekiel 37 on that Sabbath day right before first fruits. And Ezekiel 37 describes a vision that the prophet sees of a valley filled with dry bones. God speaks to Ezekiel and says, tell these bones to live. And when he does, they come alive. And so when they read this text from Ezekiel 37, on the Saturday, the Sabbath, before first fruits, it reminded the Jewish people that the feast of first fruits is not just thanking God for plant life that's going to come out of the ground, but thanking God that he will one day raise us up like seeds planted in the ground. Our bodies will be raised in the resurrection that is to come. And so let me recap what I've been talking about here, okay? Just simplify it. I've been saying a lot. Let me try to bring it all together. It's very exciting. On the Thursday night was the Passover meal. Jesus broke the bread that represented the Messiah, and he said, this is me. So you can't miss that. Friday, the next day, we saw that Jesus' body was, in fact, the afikoman, because his body was broken, then it was wrapped carefully in a cloth, and he was hidden away from God's people, placed in a tomb with a stone over the entrance. Then on Saturday, the Sabbath day before first fruits, while Jesus was planted in the ground, so to speak, Ezekiel 37 was read in the temple, describing dead bodies coming to life again. All this day, the people of Israel praying 
for the resurrection, that dead bones would come back to life, a bodily, physical resurrection from the dead. Now, doesn't that sound interesting to you? Do you think the timing of that is coincidental? Now, if you imagine the scene with me, imagine that you're one of Jesus' followers, okay? And you're streaming into the temple on that Sabbath, that Saturday. It's the day after Jesus was crucified. You're stunned still by his brutal execution the day the day before, and now you listen as the priest at the temple reads a prophetic vision of dry dead bones coming to life, and you observe that all the people around you are praying for the resurrection, that life will come out of the ground. And then what happens the next day? It's Sunday. It's the Feast of First Fruits. You're walking into Jerusalem holding on to a sheaf of barley to celebrate the resurrection that one day a full harvest will come. With that backdrop in mind, let's turn in our Bibles to the scripture reading for today. John chapter 19, verse 41. And if you need a Bible, just please put up your hand. We'd love to run one to you. We've got blue Bibles here. Just turn to page 1,545 in our blue Bibles. And I'm just going to wait for a few seconds for you to find that text in your Bible. All right, here's what it says. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw the stone had been removed from the entrance, so she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one who Jesus loved. And she said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple had reached the tomb first, went inside also. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher, Skipping now to verse 19, on the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, friends, I want to go back through the story I just read there, and I want to read it with that Eastern mindset that we've been talking about in this series, looking for the surprising way that God wants to not just tell us, but to show us the truth. Let's do what we've been doing all along in the series and look at a few interesting details and ask the question, why is that detail there? Why do I need to know this? So let's look at this from the perspective of Mary and John and Peter and the other disciples. Imagine that you two are waking up, it's early in the morning, and you hear from Mary on the Feast of First Fruits as you're gathering maybe your barley for the day. You hear that Jesus' tomb is empty. What could this mean? The first detail I want to examine is where it says, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark. Now, why do we need to know that these Easter events are taking place on the, quote, first day of the week? Why not just say Sunday? Why say the first day of the week? And why does he specifically say that these events are taking place in the early morning as the sun is coming up? I mean, why do we need to know that detail? Why do we need to know that as Mary enters the tomb, sees the stone rolled away, 
runs back to tell the disciples, and then they encounter Jesus. She encounters Jesus in the, in the garden, and as, the, as all of this is going on, what's happening? The sun is rising in the east. What could all this mean? Friends, is there another place in the Bible where first light and first day of the week are put together? Does anybody know? Anybody guess? Genesis chapter 1, the first chapter in the Bible, on the first day of creation, God says, let there be light. So why do we have these details in the story in John chapter 20? Why do we need to know the resurrection took place? And all these events happened at this particular time of the day on the first day of the week. I suggest to you that if you read this with an Eastern mindset, you'll realize that we're being shown something here, that God is starting a new creation. With the resurrection of Jesus, God is showing us that he is making all things new. Now, you might be a bit hesitant to read that much into the story. You may say, well, you know, I don't know. Maybe you're, you know, looking too much into it, Steve. So let's look at a couple more details. Let's ask the question, where is this event taking place? And who is there? Okay, so do you know where Jesus' tomb was located? In a a garden. Oh, And a garden where there's this new tomb, nobody else has ever been laid there, and so it's just Jesus until somebody shows up early in the morning, a woman, and when Mary comes along, she sees Jesus and she thinks that he is the gardener. Now, why do we need to know that it took place in a garden with one man and then one woman later on and somebody who was thought to be the gardener? Again, is there anywhere in the Bible where you've got a new garden and just one person is there, a man, and then he's joined by a woman, and then this guy, he's kind of considered the gardener of the place. Anywhere in the Bible that maybe that's, you know, lights up any sort of... The first chapter of Genesis. It's the story of creation. God creates Adam and he puts him into a garden called Eden, right? And then God brings Eve into the picture later on. And what is Adam's first job? Does anybody know what it is? It's to tend and to take care of the garden. What do you call that kind of a person? Anybody know? Something else to notice when you read the story of the resurrection is that there are two angels, okay, that are there. Why do we need to know that detail? Well, the story of creation in the Bible tells us that Adam and Eve messed up and sinned and they experienced serious consequences for that rebellion against God. And so as they were being exiled from the garden, the Bible says that God left two angels there to guard the way back into the Garden of Eden. Not to bar them from it, but to guard the way back. And this is why when we fast forward now in the story to the resurrection of Jesus, we find what? Angels. How many do we find? Two. And why does it say that one of them is sitting there where Jesus' head used to be laid and one is sitting there where his feet used to be? What does that tell us? Come on. This is not difficult, friends. Jesus' resurrection is our way back into the Garden of Eden. God is doing a new thing, and we're being invited to eat from the tree of life. Eternal life is available to us through Jesus, because his resurrection has paved the way for us to get back to a world where there is no sin, there's no death, there is no pain. This Easter season, friend, I want you to consider that God is wanting to do a new thing in your life, to plant new hope in your heart. I don't know where you need Jesus to plant new seeds of hope in you today. Perhaps it's something to do with your kids. Perhaps it's something to do with your marriage. Perhaps it's in the area of your job or in the area of your finances. Perhaps even more significantly, it's the weight and burden of sin that you carry with you every day and you need God's forgiveness. And perhaps, my friend, you've been weighed down by the reality of death, and a fear has gripped you that you don't know where you're going when you die. My friends, God wants to plant a new seed of hope in your heart.
today? Would you open up your heart to the possibility that he wants to create something new, to surprise you with something new this Easter? Now, you might be still thinking, though, you know, Steve, I'm not sure if all these details are intentionally pointing us back to creation, so let me take one more stab at convincing you. So later that evening, when Jesus appears to his disciples, what does Jesus do? It says, Jesus said, peace be with you as the Father has sent me. I'm sending you, and it says, and with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now, come on. Why do we need to know that Jesus breathed on them? That sounds weird. Why didn't John just say he said? Why breathed? Is there somewhere else where maybe this happens in the Bible, where God breathes and the Spirit of God moves into someone? Anybody know? Ring any bells? Genesis chapter 2, the story of creation. The Bible says that God breathed into this dust and Adam Receive the breath of life. The word breath there is the Hebrew word ruach, which means not just breath, but also spirit. Adam became a living being animated by the power and spirit of God. And so when you skip forward from Adam to the story of the resurrection of Jesus, we find that Jesus breathes life into his father, followers because he is God and he is giving his followers the spirit of life that will enable and empower them. And this is why you can hope, my friends, that God will plant a new seed into your life this Easter, a new seed of hope into your relationships, a new seed of hope into your finances, into your career, a new seed of hope into your need for God's forgiveness, a new seed of hope into your fear of, e of, eternal, of eternity. Because if we believe in the resurrection of Jesus, there will be a new creation that takes place within us. And we now, friends, get to participate in God's new creation that is going on not only within us, but in the world around us. I love the way biblical scholar N.T. Wright puts it. In The Challenge of Easter, his book where he says the reason the early Christians were so joyful was because they knew themselves to be living not so much in the last days, which was true, but in the first days, the opening days of God's new creation. Take a look, my friends, at the screens to see how just one family at Gateway here is seeking to live out this hope in the resurrection through challenging circumstances. Michelle and Steve invited Krista and I and a couple of other families over to their home, and we celebrated the Passover as Christians a week and a half ago. And it was just an awesome experience to realize how this ancient tradition points so much and was fulfilled by Jesus Christ. And my prayer is that you would have the hope that the resurrection of Jesus provides at this Easter that you would understand that we not only celebrate Jesus' resurrection, but we also celebrate our resurrection too. Check this out. It's really interesting, something that took place in Matthew chapter 27. Matthew's gospel tells us what took place on the Friday when Jesus died. And it says this, the earth shook, rocks split apart, tombs opened, the bodies of many godly men and women who had died were raised from the dead. They left the cemetery after Jesus' resurrection, went into the holy city of Jerusalem, and appeared to many. Now, what's interesting about this text, not only is that you've got dead people coming to life again, but they do so before Jesus rises again. Now, isn't that bizarre? They rise again on Friday, and it tells us that Jesus' death then is what broke the power of death. That's what that demonstrates. But then it says, and this is weird, they didn't come out of the cemetery until when? Not Friday, not Saturday. What day did they come out of the cemetery? On Sunday. Now that's a bizarre thing. Why do we need to know this? That they were raised to life on Friday, hung around the cemetery, and then finally came out in Jerusalem on Sunday after Jesus rose again. Now, it wasn't until the festival of first fruits that these people who rose from the dead appeared. Can we see what God is showing us when everybody is walking into Jerusalem, holding on to their little sheaf of barley as their first fruit offering, having prayed the day before? that life would come out of the ground. What does this mean, my friends? This is just a tiny beginning. 
These risen people went into the holy city of Jerusalem <coughs> right as the first fruits of the coming resurrection. That's what that meant. They are one little sheaf of barley. They remind us that God's new creation, we're not waiting for it to come. It's already begun. And you and me, we are all a part of it. We are not just waiting around, friends, for Jesus to come back. We are part of God's new creation now. In his first letter to the Corinthians, the Apostle Paul makes this obvious connection. He says, Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And so in the festival of first fruits, people would plant their barley seeds early in the spring and then they would consider and celebrate a small harvest at the beginning, knowing that a bigger harvest is coming later in much the same way. Jesus was resurrected to help us to celebrate that we too will be resurrected resurrected Jesus just as Jesus was. Jesus came and those who rose from the dead on Good Friday are part of the first fruits, reminding us that the new creation has started already and one day we will receive the consummation of that. New bodies, just like what Jesus received. New bodies that will never get sick, never get tired. Spirit-powered bodies. We will one day be better off than Adam and Eve ever were when we receive our resurrection bodies. And we will experience a perfect connection with God. But in the meantime, as we await the final resurrection, let us remember to plant seeds of hope in our hearts. <coughs> let us be sure to water those seeds with prayer. Because friends, we are part of God's revolution of love on the planet. Friends, he's already begun to do a new thing in your life, in your society, in your neighborhood, in you, your world. So let's take the opportunity this Easter to just plant a seed of faith and believe that we are not just part of the last days. We are part of the first days of God's new creation. <laughs>